Hello, I'm Lizzie Daly and I am thrilled to be presenting today's event, which is part of Selfridges virtual event series. Uh, and today marks a very special day. It's of course Earth Day, so happy Earth Day to everyone uh, watching. And um, today's event is part of Selfridges Project Earth Initiative, a journey that the uh, store has actually been on to put sustainability at the heart of the business and to strive for a future where everyone completely changes the way that we shop by 2025. This event, of course, is also co-hosted by Intelligent Squared, which is, of course, the world's leading forum for live debates and discussions. And tonight, we're going to be focusing on the importance of nature and also how to make nature accessible for all. We all know and understand the importance and the value of nature, but still so many communities find nature, the outdoors and wildlife so inaccessible. City dwellers and in particular BIPOC communities still struggle to connect with green spaces or find green spaces uh, on their doorstep and activities such as hiking and, and bird watching still seem so out of reach for so many. So tonight we're going to be discussing all of this with three wonderful uh, panelists uh, this evening who I'll introduce to you very shortly, but we're going to be covering everything from the importance of nature, how to make a nature accessible for all. These three panelists have been working tirelessly to highlight some of these biggest inequalities and actually carrying out some pretty epic work to strive for a future where nature is accessible for all. So. First up, we have Ellen Miles, who is a creative strategist and social innovator with a focus on the relationship between social and climate justice. Ellen is also the founder of the campaign Nature is a Human Right. Hello, Ellen. Um, we also have Maya Rose Craig, who is an ornithologist, a bird writer, naturalist and campaigner for equal rights. Uh, she's also the youngest person in the UK to receive an honorary Doctor of Science award. You may know Maya uh, more commonly as Bird Girl UK. Nice to see you again, Maya. And last but not least, uh, Gina Malley, who is a systems change organiser with UKYCC, of course, the UK Youth Climate Coalition. She's currently interested in the lack of land rights in England and how it co-creates systems of oppression and a disconnect from nature. She's also a youth board member for Friends of the Earth. So those are brilliant panelists tonight. Don't forget, I'm going to be taking your questions. We wanna hear from you wherever you're watching live tonight, make sure you submit your questions, tell us uh, where you're watching. Uh, and if you're inspired by some of the conversations tonight, interact with us, we wanna hear from you. So uh, if you add in your questions at the end of today's panel discussion, I'll be reading some of those out to our wonderful panelists tonight. So. First off, um, I'm going to start by asking each one of you to tell us briefly how you came to realize the importance of nature. Was there a particular event that kind of kicked everything off for you or have you always been inspired? Ellen, I'll come to you first. Um, yeah, so I, I'm from London, I'm from East London, but I spent most of my childhood holidays and weekends out in rural Essex, um, which was a very different scene. It was like a car free little hamlet, um, very community focused, really safe feeling and spent the whole time kind of running around, scabbing my knees up in nature. Um, and I don't think I really realized the significance of that till recently, but I think it gave me from an early age an understanding of the kind of nature and community shaped holes in city life um, coming from a, like a very busy, polluted, often very violent road um, in Hackney um, versus the kind of rural rolling Essex countryside. And I think also what I've started to appreciate more in recent years is how my mental health, my mindset was different um, in those two spaces, um, like having being one of the, you know, large number of people that suffer with mental health problems throughout my life. I've um really started to appreciate that difference in more recent years and i think like most people especially in the last year yeah we've had that rare opportunity to kind of reconnect with what's on our doorstep haven't we and that contrast is so true for so many people um Maya Rose, now I know from speaking to you previously, you have had a deep rooted connection with wildlife from a, from an early age so tell us more about your background yeah, I mean, in some ways, I don't think my story is particularly exciting because uh, <laughs> my parents 
<laughs> my older sister were bird watchers long before I was ever even born and I've been taken out into nature pretty much every weekend of my life literally since I was a baby and I think that combined with being very lucky living in an incredibly rural area um, just meant that nature has always been such a big part of my life and I literally couldn't imagine my life or, or even who I would be if I hadn't had that sort of upbringing so I think it's totally shaped me. Mm. Such an important part of what you do now as well so not boring in any way because obviously you're, you're doing lots of great things and we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, Gina was there a particular event or time for you or has it always been deep rooted in your life as well? Um, I was thinking about this and I was like there's two like current things that have happened but then I, that then also made me remember a lot about when I was growing up, like I grew up in this town that was outside Birmingham and it was a collection of towns that was called the Black Country because it had the uh, industries there and the pollution from there just created this like black cloud of like smog essentially um, and after we de-industrialised, like loads of people lost their jobs and it became like quite like a grey area so the name stuck and I think like my first interest was through um like air pollution issues and like one of the ways to kind of get a slight relief from that was like accessing little pockets of nature and like I was super super lucky to live next to a woodland and um, that like I could just literally walk like not even five minutes to get in there but actually um I didn't feel safe using it on my own like I'd feel safe using it with mm. my friends but not even with my family like as a racialized person and because of some of the ways it would get used and um, it didn't really feel like I could just be in there freely as I wanted and um, but I still really like found that space quite like sacred I think it's like a fair word for me to use but um but then like recently I've taken a bit more of an active interest in it for like two different reasons like I actually found out really recently that um in England the only reason we even have well one of the reasons we have access to like our national parks was because of this m mass trespass of kinder scout that happened in 1932 which was basically like um a working class protest from communities in manchester and sheffield where they wanted to highlight that we didn't have access to countryside in england and wales so they just like walked up kinder scout which if you live in sheffield you know the peak district it's like the tallest summit peak district but um yeah, so they want they just like walked up in the sky because they were like, this land is literally used to hunt grabs and nothing else. So like, why can't we have access to it? Um, and then like, yeah, that just made me realise, wow, we haven't actually had access to something that I'm really aware of having access to. Um, so yeah, and then because my activism really looks at like how we create systemic change um, to achieve climate justice and because we know that like it wasn't caused by individual action and all that, like access to land really ties into like the issues of like massive over exploitation and stuff so um i feel like it's really made me realize how access to nature is like a structural injustice that we like with the unequal access that we have so yeah yeah i think such an important point as well many people i'm sure don't even think about the the land in which it's used and it's like really interesting to hear about how even yourself like picking up on small pockets of wild spaces but obviously the limitations that you've experienced which is a, a massive massive uh, a massive part of that which is often overlooked so yeah um brilliant to hear all, all your experiences and i'll go into um that very shortly in a bit more detail but ellen um you run a brilliant campaign called nature is a human right um mm -hmm. it's dedicated to having access to nature recognized by the un as an official human right which i just think is absolutely fantastic why is it so important that this is recognized internationally so it's kind of building from everything gina just said i think she's very much um the reason that we need to enshrine access to nature as a human right because there is a structural a structural um, inequality about the way that green space is distributed and the way that people are allowed or feel like they're welcomed into these green spaces. Um, the, the wider issue is urbanization. So already over half the world's population of 
in urban environments. And by 2050, the UN thinks it's going to be about two in three people living in towns and cities. Um, and obviously, the way that these cities have developed is in a kind of biophobic manner. So which means that they're not prioritizing green space, they're prioritizing cars and commerce and roads and the gray stuff over the green stuff. Um, and particularly in areas that are underfunded and, and um, are home to low income communities and communities of color. And that's all, all over the world. Um, so in these areas, there's less greenery. Um, and this leads to all kinds of health and mental health issues um because as humans our natural habitat is nature um, we need it around us to feel um as we should do uh and it's the lack of it around us is leading to kind of myriad social um and well-being issues it's putting strain on the nhs it's it leads to high crime rates there's all of these awful consequences of, of nature deprivation um and it's an environmental inequality that comes from um these systems of oppression and marginalization um, and it's absolutely something that we can tackle and change um so because we need nature and because it's no longer something we can take for granted um because it's being taken away from millions of people uh, we need to enshrine it as a human right to protect present and future generations from the terrible consequences of nature deprivation yeah, a really valuable campaign and and um, a really kind of important time to have a campaign like that. Since since starting it, you, you mentioned it was about a year ago, right? Have you seen a positive response? I, I think it's drawn, yes, absolutely. It's drawn so many people in. I think because it sits at the intersection of climate and social justice, um, there's so much, there's so many reasons why you might want to get involved or why you might want to champion it, whether you're interested in people or the planet or just plants. Um, there's so many reasons or biodiversity making our cities greener and making access to nature something that everyone has um has myriad benefits um so for example people having a greater connection to nature has actually been shown to make people be more um active more pro-environmental ways um so it's a kind mm -hmm. of it's a solution that we're not even discussing that's not being taken seriously there's so many reasons um that this would just revolutionize the way um that that society works and um we've seen so many people kind of joining on board and it's it's growing it's growing it's only been a year mm. but i feel like um this year is going to be a huge boom of growth yeah Pe people want it people need it it's about time you know we had that real push with campaigns like yours so um yeah i think it's absolutely brilliant um my rose um I've been following your work for quite a while. You're, you're an inspiration to so many of us um, in and out of the birding community. What do you see as the main benefits for nature, for yourself and for others? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's so many benefits for nature. And I think some of them were touched on there. The fact that it is by pe having people, giving them that opportunity to engage with nature, you're meaning that they're going to engage with the environmental movement and start to care about environmental issues because people can't care about something that they've never experienced. But I think nature is also really important for our own mental and physical well-being. Um, so I have a charity, Black to Nature, and we specifically work with people from minority ethnic backgrounds. But um, one of the things we spend a lot of time talking to children in particular when we're running nature camps, we're bringing them out of the city, is about mental health. Because I think um, nature is so, so important for our mental health. Like again, was touched on a second ago, we've sort of created these environments for ourselves that are completely blank of nature because we sort of see ourselves as above and separate from it. When in reality, it's absolutely key to our well-being. So there's a massive issue to do with mental illness within minority ethnic communities. They're massively disproportionately represented in terms of the population being sectioned in the UK, um, with black men being the most, well, the section of the population dealing with the most mental illness. And it's mm -hmm. not that I think going out into nature is magically going to solve severe mental illness. But I think a lot of what we're doing with young kids in particular is giving them the tools to manage their own mental health. Like we're talking to like eight or nine year olds just saying, if you're stressed, if you're unhappy, if you're angry, you can just go and sit by yourself in the park for 10 or 20 minutes and just breathe. And I think that that kind of messaging is so, so important, especially in the last year. Um, and is especially important 
in a time where the NHS is doing things like green prescribing and really acknowledging the importance of nature for us. Yeah, and obviously nature's been a big part of your life, but kind of what's your, for, for you, how have you seen it benefiting you? I'm guessing you may have a super busy week doing lots of kind of conversations like this and you head out on the weekends. Do you see that physically and mentally benefiting you? Yeah, I mean, I, I always joke that nature's my version of mindfulness because I am far too fidgety to actually do something like <laughs> yoga or meditating. Um, and yeah, I think like it is for a lot of people, nature's really important to me because it is that sep that like separation from everyday life and separation from work and the things that you're stressed about and the things that you're sort of obsessing over. Um, and I think I used to enjoy nature as a very social thing, but I think increasingly as I've gotten older, because it is something that's very peaceful and very meditative for me, it's something that I sort of enjoy doing solo. Um, and I think it's just a really nice experience being out in like a woodland or as no by a lake or something, just watching the birds. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's quite like a humbling feeling to be out in nature. It kind of reminds you that it will be okay and it can be a really calming effect just sitting as you say even for 20 minutes so yeah can, can agree more um gina if i can come back to you because you mentioned about the importance of, of access to land and to nature but um why is it so important especially here in the uk and especially now yeah so there's like yeah there's many things but um, I'm trying to yeah, like, I'm just sure. focus on one. No, no, sorry. Um, yeah, so I think like there's there's something around like like what what Myro said about like the importance to our mental health and that's huge. And then there's also something that like Elena said about um, how can we kind of care if we don't have a relationship. And I think. Mm -hmm. um, I see land and like access to nature in that way from a very systemic lens um, and so that you know that I, like understand that it's also a racial climate and land justice issue like there's an organization called land in our names that are uk based and they're a really great black led grassroots organization and they talk about how the lack of access to nature causes food insecurity health inequalities environmental injustices and a widespread disconnect from nature and it's that disconnect from nature that like I think it what really resonates with me is what's important. Um, I, I really think that like our relationship with nature is probably one of the most important relationships we'll have in our life. Um, and if we have access to that, we get taught like reciprocity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so <laughs> I've been like reading this really great book called um, Braiding the Sweetgrass, and I really recommend it. It's, um, by Robin Kimura, um, and she's an indigenous writer from the Potawatomi, Potawatomi Nation. And um, basically talks a lot about like indigenous knowledge and science in regards to plants. And the way she starts it off, I won't like repeat what she said, but like um, she basically talks about how her relationship with growing with the land has taught her how much land gives to us and how we have to honor that and actually see ourselves as part of the ecosystem that we are that it's really hard for us to do I think in cities um, and like it's in some ways can be ridiculous to think about people owning land because of how much we get from land um, and like currently in England it's like there's a lot of like problems that we have that are linked to like being disconnected being tired being alienated and lonely um, means that it's not easy for us to have a relationship with nature and with green space and I think that really links into then like not being able to understand like what's happening in terms of climate change as well and not having that connection or that that capacity to care like when you've got to worry about the, your like food that you need to get on the table or bills like and you don't live in a space that's easy to access like who like honestly who has time for that um, it's yeah. really hard in the system and then that means that we then can't also hold our governments to account for the change that they need to make and like yeah um, just as well like specifically to England that I think this is really, really important is because like um, like when I was like researching stuff online I found out that like one percent of our population owns um, more than 50 percent of the land in England 
um, and some major owners are like these are like the elite people like you can imagine that like the queen is part of this one percent i think actually like james dyson from dyson hoovers is also one of them which i think is really interesting um and then like also a lot of people who um have the estates for grouse hunting um own like so much land and it's that thing of like who owns land choose like they get to choose how it's used and it has huge implications for everything like where we build our homes how we grow our food how we protect ourselves from flooding like being able to like support wildlife systems it's all hugely affected by who own land who owns land and given that such a small one percent of our population own more than 50 percent i feel like that really feeds into like the issue of justice around land ownership in the in england and wales yeah well said i couldn't agree more those kind of social issues are directly linked with the ecological issues in which our land land looks at the moment and if you look across the uk i mean it's really kind of shocking to see how our land is used with huge areas of farmland as you say grouse shooting activity and it shouldn't be an, an, an elite thing it should be something that is yeah I, I think you're really really important work um so it's clear obviously the importance of of nature for physical mental and, and mental and physical health but obviously not everyone has equal access to it ellen if i come to you first what do you see as i guess the or who do you see as the, the key group that is excluded from from this nature and why do you think that is and and how have you found that out throughout your your career so far um, so in terms of exclusion from nature there's there's you have to look at the cities and you have to look at the countryside and without a doubt across both um, types of land, it's people of colour that are being excluded um, in different ways. Obviously in the countryside, there's systemic racism. Um, you know, there's far many more like racist attacks happening in the countryside. And it, it's um, just the whole elitist structure of the way that even outdoor activities are being marketed um, has like no visibility or very little visibility of people of colour. And in the cities, the, the way that the the cities are built and designed the way that people have been kind of ghettoized and particularly in America with like the legacy of redlining. Um, there are terrible issues with regards to urban planning around communities of color and the fact that there's far less green space provision and the green space that there is, is of not sufficient quality. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of left to go ruin and then people kind of use it just to like throw trash around and like there's no surprise because of the way that um, the councils or the local authorities are kind of treating it um so yeah i would say like without a doubt um it you know it's wealthier whiter communities that have greater access to nature across the board yeah, whether it's in the border, um, or in the countryside um and that's not to say you know like not all white people obviously like uh low-income households um in cities in particular obviously have less access to nature as well um mm. but well, that is the kind of the lay of the land no pun intended yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Talk about land use. Um, my Rose, would you say that's that's also true, and that's something that you've seen in your career as well? Yeah, I definitely think so. So, like I mentioned, I uh, work with minority ethnic people in particular, and I know that when I started, a lot of people felt like that work wasn't necessarily the most helpful direction to go in, in terms of that they didn't feel like there was an issue just in terms of race. They felt like. Um, I suppose there was a class issue going on instead. Um, and I think it wouldn't be honest of me to say that there isn't class issues going on because obviously the whole system of everything in the UK is totally centered around class. Um, but I just sort of felt in my gut that that wasn't quite what was going on or that wasn't quite an explanation for why basically no one I knew that wasn't white wasn't going out into the countryside. Um, and it was about a year later that some really interesting research came out basically proving that regardless of class minority ethnic kids were going out into the na into green spaces less by about 15 percent which is really big numbers because the bar was very low um in this mm. survey um so yeah that that's one of the reasons that i work with minority ethnic people in particular but like i said i think that there's also a lot of issues within the uk in terms of just the privilege that you need to be able to access the countryside and be able to access green spaces. And it's been that way for a really long time. Um, 
based probably since like the industrial revolution where you have poorer people moving into cities rather than into the countryside where a lot of people just really struggle to get out into the countryside because they don't have enough time or energy or or money and when things like public transport are so so expensive it's not these very um i suppose intangible social barriers there are very physical things stopping people from being able to access decent chunks of green space, which I think a lot of people, you know, have become very aware of during lockdown when all the parks were shut. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talk about that over the past year, reconnecting with nature, those issues were, were definitely highlighted. Um, and again, echoing what I said earlier, all your work is so, so valuable more than ever at this time. Um, Gina, uh, before we kind of move on to talk about some other exciting work that you're all doing, you of course work with the UK Youth Climate Coalition, uh, which is youth led and it's a non-profit organization, which is brilliant. But can you tell me more about what what you do, your research and what the, the organization is doing in terms of access to land? Yeah, so, um... At UK Youth Climate Coalition, uh, because we're kind of volunteer led, we all have like mini working groups. And so I'm involved in the systems change working group, which is just like a fancy way of saying that like we approach climate change from like the structures and like what the government and the big companies should be doing instead of us and our like, like individual action. Um, and so like, Kind of the background to the work that we 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 like want to start doing on this is that um, we basically did a prank campaign. Um, we found out that in Mozambique, a fossil fuel company called Total were going to start drilling for gas in this area of Mozambique, and it would like destroy the local habitat. It was like displacing the community and would have huge impacts on their traditional fishing, um, which was like one of the ways they have like like food to um, mm. feed the community. And in, we at UK Youth Climate Coalition felt like responsible for this because one of the UK government departments um, do oversees financial aid. And through that, they were part funding this project, which we thought was absolutely ridiculous because earlier on this year, Boris had come out being like, we are stopping funding anything that's connected to fossil fuels overseas. But this, some, this one somehow managed to angle its way through. Um, so we, to work on that, we basically took like, all the information about this um, drilling for gas that's happening in Mozambique and created like a fake website and fake information for it and pretended that it was going to happen in St Ives in Cornwall. Um, I don't know if many of you have ever been there, but it's like it's a ludicrously beautiful seaside like <laughs> place in, in the south of England. And it's a huge tourist hotspot, loads of like, like, loads of like second homes are there. Not a lot of the people who were born there actually live there because of the amount of like cost to homes there. Um, and we basically wanted to make this point that look at what access to nature we have here, or at least some of us have here in England. Um, and from our taxpayers, we're, we're going to like end up funding the destruction of this, something that we value so much here. Um, why would we then like want our taxes to go to that abroad like why would like and also like fossil fuels are over so why like what are we doing with that <laughs> um so yeah like and alongside this with some other amazing work from like um friends of the earth in england wales northern ireland and like global justice now and just ek ambiental who is the local group in mozambique uh, the government did come out and put a halt to the funding there um, which is really great. I think there's still some work to do because they can always do a U-turn or Total could decide to do it without that funding anyway. But the reason we took this, like part of the reason we took this approach is because we really wanted to highlight how, like, one, we are so against protecting the nature that, like, we're so up for protecting the nature that we have um, and want to, like, translate to that and how that links to also access to nature, like, internationally. But also, like, with St Ives, it's quite a topical place. It is a place of like where a lot of elite people will go. Um, and like I mentioned earlier about like a lot of people have their very expensive second homes there. Um, and local people are displaced from their own area. Um, and so we have like this beautiful countryside, but also like not everyone even has access to that um, yeah. in England. 
um, which yeah, basically got me looking into land rights, um, which I can touch on a bit later. Yeah, no, please do. I, I love that kind of campaign strategy. You're completely putting our way of thinking of, of conserving land and approaching these issues from being kind of local to, to having this international mindset, which is so valuable. So yeah, that's really brilliant to hear. And Ellen, as well as um, uh, Nature is a Human Right and that campaign, you also are the founder of Dream Green, right? Which helps people engage with guerrilla gardening. For those who don't know who are listening, <laughs> what is it and what do you do at Dream Green? <laughs> So guerrilla gardening, as I define it, is planting <laughs> in a public place with purpose. So it's this idea that um, we need to make our cities greener. We can't wait for the powers that be to do that because we'll be waiting around forever. They are doing it a lot, but often the solutions that come from the kind of top down miss, miss the mark on what communities really need. And so by kind of channeling this grassroots um again, no pun intended, <laughs> way of acting from the ground up, we can really um, make our cities greener in meaningful ways and create these vital community spaces. And also by having people engage with it themselves, they're getting those mental and physical benefits way more. So guerrilla gardening is essentially taking greening action into your own hands, um, whether that's planting in a street tree bed, um, turning an abandoned lot into the community allotment or creating a pallet parklet uh, in a parking space. Um, there's loads of different things you can do. And Dream Green um, is my social enterprise, which essentially exists to educate and equip people to become guerrilla gardeners. Because I think a lot of people don't know what it is or when they hear about it, they're like, that sounds awesome. Um, I really want to give that a go, but I, I'm too underinformed or like overwhelmed, underqualified. Um, and so Dream Green is there just to basically kind of give you a all of the information and the tools you might need to get started and show you that it's really easy and it's actually something anyone can and should do. And have you had like a variety of, of communities and people coming to do this? I mean, I want to do it. It sounds epic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do it. Yeah, there's loads of people. Again, it's like people who love communities want to get involved, people who love kind of people who want to save the bees want to get involved and create these little pollinator friendly wildflower habitats in, you know, areas lacking biodiversity um people who want to help with air pollution and stopping all of that in areas which is um so vital um there's all these different reasons so we've seen so i run a kind of local hackney group we, we've done several things um taking on quite a big spot at the moment um but yeah people from all over the country have been uh, getting involved and so i'm hoping to kind of expand that out and the first of may actually is international sunflower guerrilla gardening day which is when people across um, the northern hemisphere take to the streets to plant sunflowers out uh, in public and sunflowers are great because uh, they give pollinators and you can actually eat them so they're kind of good for um food poverty as well and self-sufficiently you can eat the whole plant everyone knows about the seeds but you can eat the whole thing um so yeah if anyone's free on the first of may and wants to kind of stick some sunflower seeds in the ground i would encourage you to get involved and to do that yes okay that's like upcoming as well it's something that everyone can do uh pretty imminently so yeah thanks for sharing that i'm sure everyone on here will be yeah. doing that um <laughs> my rose um i want to know more about your black to nature camps obviously you've laid the land of kind of what what it does but like what activities do you offer what are the kind of things that people can learn by being part of your camps yeah it's it's funny actually because when i first started the camps in 2015 they were really like jam-packed full of activities dawn till dusk maybe a bit after dusk if we were going to look for like night jars or something and i was having a great time but these poor kids must have been exhausted <laughs> um, so these days we we've paired it back a little bit but we do loads of different activities because I genuinely think that one of the best ways to try and scoop everyone up that comes along on the camps and help them to engage with nature in some shape or form is to have lots of variety. So we have the more like traditional types of nature stuff. So we do bird watching, we do mothing, we do a bit of bat stuff sometimes. Um, but we also do quite creative stuff like nature art or nature photography. Um, we try and get people up close and personal with wildlife by doing a bit of bird ringing, getting them to let the birds go. And a surprising number of kids are very, very scared of letting the birds anywhere near them. Um, and yeah, we're just going for lots of different things. Um, but I think something that actually took me a couple of 
camps to realize is that it's kind of not the activities like they're really fun and they're what we do on the camp but the real thing that's engaging people with nature and helping them to experience the outdoors is just being in the countryside and spending time out in nature because a lot of them have literally never been to the countryside before they've never camped they've never done anything like that um because their parents have never let them go on school camp um so it's such a totally new experience that everything is very very exciting for them and how do you kind of reach out and and get people on board to learn learn more about your camps and like encourage them to take part is that social media or uh, a real combination actually so um we we i think we've really built up a network of people to engage with to try and get more people to come to the camps we have a lot of conversations actually with community groups and things like that um, a lot of people ask me if we do it through schools and for some reason when I was first starting that never really occurred to me. Um, so we go through uh, religious leaders sometimes, local religious leaders through community groups, just through knowing people. WhatsApp groups is kind of a classic these days. People are always sharing things in WhatsApp groups. Um, mm -hmm. And it's quite easy to get people along for events. But I think um something that's really interesting i guess that we do that other people don't do that makes us unique in terms of camps is the fact that we spend quite a lot of time talking to parents beforehand to try and get them to trust us with their children because there are so many different barriers in terms of what's stopping people going out we touched on some of them earlier but one of them is just the fact that they a lot of people feel like the countryside is very unwelcoming and elitist and possibly even racist and we spend a lot of time talking to the parents helping them to understand why we think this would be such a good opportunity for their kids to experience. Um, and I suppose reassuring them that the camps are going to be good enough in the first place up to their standards. And the fact even that my mum and my sister and I are Muslim makes a massive difference in terms of people trusting us with their children, basically, because it's just little things like they know that the food's going to be halal. They know that if their kids are getting up in the night to pray, we won't get annoyed with them. They know the, I don't know, the boys and girls' tents are going to be very separate. You know, th things like that make a big difference to parents. And I think that's one of the reasons that we succeed where things like school camps fail. Mm. Do you have any camps coming up or planned for the future? I'm guessing this will just get bigger and better over time. Yeah, we have lots of camps planned for the summer, actually, and I'm really excited about it, especially after the year that we've all had. Um, so we do a lot. Of them, well, they're all in the southwest. So we have a lot in the sort of Glastonbury, Somer Somerset level, uh, Somerset levels area. Um, but this year it's quite exciting because we're also doing some down on Dartmoor and one in the New Forest as well. And we've also got funding to work with kids from London for the first time on a five day long camp which is really exciting because a lot of the kids when they come along for a weekend they're always like oh i'm just settling in i wish we had a few more days um so yeah a, lots of great stuff happening this summer with black nature i can see it getting bigger bigger and better every year i'm sure before you know it it'll be a, a just yeah hard to book on i'm sure <laughs> Um, Gina, tell us more about kind of your work with Friends of the Earth, Wales, England and Northern Ireland. And can you tell us more about how they they are striving to become more inclusive and improve access to nature? Yeah, so like currently what they've been doing is um, creating like, well, doing some research, but also creating a website, uh, a tool online um, to help you find out if you live in areas that have a shortage of green space like in urban dwellings um, and like yeah there's a lot of like not very nice data which is like around one in five of us um, are deprived of green space because over like over like a thousand neighborhoods in the UK um, are deprived of green space and that you know black and brown people are twice as likely to live in a neighborhood with minimal access to green space almost 40 percent of people from BAME backgrounds live in the most green space deprived areas compared to just 14 percent of white people and children um, from the most deprived areas are 20 percent less likely to spend time outside than those in affluent areas and so like yeah the kind of way it works with with friends of the earth in england wales and northern ireland is that 
you know, they're going to use this data is used to highlight and like provide further evidence to the inequality of who can access green spaces and who can access nature. Um, but they're like currently trying to take time to prepare a campaign on this because when this work does get taken forward, it really wants to like have like justice principles at the centre of it. Um, to fit, so actually figuring out a way that we can truly benefit those most impacted. But at the moment, they've um, created a web page for people so you can check the green space in your area. Um, and it links to an action that you can take to commit to a green and fair recovery plan. So I think if you Google Friends of the Earth green space, um, you can find that page if you're interested in looking at your area. That's brilliant. Yeah, a nice little takeaway for, for people who are listening. And t tell us more about the group that you're part of, Wanderers of Colour as well. What activities do you do as part of that? Yeah, um, so Wanderers of Colour was set up by IFE as like a Facebook group, actually. Um, and I think it's a really nice story of how you can just set something up small and it like snowballs. But it was basically set up as like a way to connect like racialized people um, who wanted to like travel and like go to nature spaces or the countryside um, and they also kind of became like a space to decompress um, like and share their experiences like for example when me and my sister go to the countryside like the Peak District which is next to Sheffield we will get stopped quite a lot and be like oh hey you're right do you know where you're going um, and I'll just caveat with that me and my sister are actually like very good map readers um, <laughs> but when I go to the Peak District with my white male partner like that doesn't happen nobody stops and checks in to see if we know where we are or where we're going and um, so yeah like it was being like a space to decompress which like I mean it can sound really simple but I think decompression and actually like processing some of the like different ways you get treated is really part of like that healing space and then um, currently after like um, a really cool weekend away back in 2019 by the way um, <laughs> like we wanted we want to set up like organized countryside walks where um, whereby like so my role in that would be a walk leader as someone who knows how to read maps and can create routes and knows how to use my compass and stuff I can take off the pressure of being like, oh, well, I've never been to the countryside before. Where do I walk? How do I not get lost? And also share like information that's like, okay, yeah, a waterproof might be useful, but like don't need to buy really expensive walking boots because like if you've just got a good solid pair of shoes, we'll go on a walk where that won't be an issue. Because there's a lot of these different things that like like we've mentioned, make it really inaccessible to access if you not kind of grown up knowing that information. Um, and before you get exposure to the countryside, you don't really learn like different parts of like the things that's called like the countryside code and so it can be really hard and you can feel very othered and um, so yeah like with wonders of color we're actually trying to find funding which um <laughs> is hard <laughs> like this sometimes um yeah but yeah like what that work really looks at is for me anyway it's like it's centering joy and creating fun experiences out there and like to kind of, I feel like what you're, all, what we're all working on is like a society where joy is in abundance. So like, doing these like more like local kind of walks where you create a really nice environment and create a nice space is like creating joy on the way to a society with more joy, um, yeah. which is 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 a nice way to do it instead of being burnt out. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's those it's those little barriers that are so huge. I, I I guess in the grand scheme of things, things that you may not even realize, like yeah, shoes and and what coats take and map reading. Yeah, it's really thank you for sharing that. Um, um, we're going to move on to audience questions. Another reminder to all the wonderful people listening: please do get your questions in. We've got some coming in already, um, and have done throughout today's fantastic talk. So we'll, we'll go to those just now. But any any more questions, get them in as well, and let us know where you're watching in live as well. Or if there's anything that's kind of struck a chord um, with you. Okay, uh, let's start with a question from Ben, um, who says, "Actually, did I miss one?" Of Above. Yes. Okay. So Ben says, um, you have spoken a lot about the countryside. How can we access nature more freely within our cities? Do you have any tips? So Ellen, I'll go to you first. So I, my perspective on this and um, the other women are free to disagree with me is that 
it shouldn't be the responsibility of the citizens to seek out the nature in the cities, but instead what we need to do is start redesigning our cities to bring nature to people. Um, so Paris um, have want to redesign the city as this like 15 minute city thing where everything you'll need um, will be within a 15 minute walk, which frees up space um, from roads to be taken over um, by green spaces. Similar, similarly in Barcelona, they're gonna have a car free grid where sort of every fourth street in both direction will be car free and taken over for people, which allows space for community as well as for green space. Um, and Athens are doing a really fantastic job of building pocket parks, which is exactly what it sounds like, just these tiny parks um around the city so there's all of these amazing things we can be doing with green infrastructure and also cool things like biophilic architecture so like green walls um living roofs where are these neglected bare patches of land that could be used for kind of community green spaces so um and also doing so it's worth investing in these things because you see a massive return on investment as like a kind of from a governmental lens in terms of like reduced strain on the nhs reduced crime reduced mental health issues all of this stuff is um there's so many social benefits for people that it's just completely worth doing um and it is the future so my answer to that question is yes we can seek out um green spaces and there are you know um from london i'm extremely privileged to live in a very green city um but i do think the onus should be on um our government to provide people with the green space um all around them in within immediate walking distance um rather than having mm -hmm. people to seek it out yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. You need kind of a, um, a framework, if you like, to actually give that access and, and for it not to be uh, discriminated. Maya Rose, um, for an individual that perhaps lives in the middle of a city, is listening to this and thinking, I want to connect with nature and explore my green spaces, what would be your, your top tips? I actually did a whole series of blog posts at the start of the first lockdown about like little ways that people could it maintain that connection with nature if they were say locked in a high rise flat or something like that and it is really difficult because i think our relationship with nature in the uk is totally framed around going somewhere else whether that's going to the countryside or going to the big park um which i guess is what alan was talking about um but we came up with just lots of little things whether that was um just having a little herb garden um in your window or like watching the birds fly by um and I think that it's little things like that that really got people through lockdown. But I think at the same time, it is really important to acknowledge that people kind of shouldn't have to do that. Um, like they shouldn't have to rely on a couple of potted plants in their flat to keep the, to keep them going mentally. Um, and again, Ellen's touched on this really well. But I think something that people maybe don't talk about enough is that there is also a real contrast in terms of quality in green space depending where in the city you are. Um, so if you're in a wealthier, nicer area, the green spaces, the parks are all very lush, very lovely, lots of big flower beds. While the um, green spaces in less well-off areas are often just massive patches of grass, um, which work really well practically, but they're not really nature. And I something I think about a lot is how easy it would just be to leave patches unmowed and just let them grow and let the flowers grow in and things like that and it's totally low effort and i think things like changes like that are really important but in terms of connecting with nature i'm always a really big advocate for bird watching i birds are literally <laughs> everywhere including in the middle of the city so if you're looking for a way to connect with nature i think becoming a bird watcher is a pretty good way to do that Pretty good way. And then we'll start to see now all these people going out and guerrilla gardening, these green spaces that are perhaps less well managed. I can see it happening after this uh, after this discussion. Um, OK, so uh, we've got another one. I'll come to, to you, Gina, if I can, for this one. This is from Sarah. What can we as individuals do to help our communities? And she says, I love the idea of, of guerrilla gardening. Um, I'll come on to you. So I'll come on to all of you. But Gina. <laughs> Yeah, I also love the idea of gorilla gardening. And also, Ellen, I think I said your name is Eleanor. I'm really sorry about that previously. So, but that is a question. Um, what can people do? I think it's a really great question. Like, um, one of the things that I personally love doing, like I mentioned, like, oh, I love the idea of doing is like, I've benefited from a couple of different initiatives that meant that, like, 
um, I've like learned how to read a map without having to pay for an expensive course and use do my compass navigation. And um, when I was at sixth form, my my um, my sixth form did initiatives to um, help people from like uh, lower income families to access Duke of Edinburgh because you need a tent, you need like a bag, you need walking boots, can be really expensive. And because of the teachers in that school being like, oh, this is a great initiative, but it's also got, it's not accessible to all the kids we have. They like put the effort in to get funding for that. So like, those are all the reason that I've got these skills or these experiences, which has really helped me create a relationship with nature is because people have like, questioned and been like, what skills do I have access to? So like now that's what I'm doing and like, I will pass on my map reading skills with friends if they're interested um, and like really try to break it down. So it's like, it's like a skill share, a big skill share. Like I think there are likely ways that you access nature that you can think, oh, I access nature in this way. How can I share my experience of this with someone else in a way that they want? Um, and I think like, it's, sorry, it's not like a very perfect packaged answer of do X, Y, Z, but like, if if we all can look a little about a little bit about like what skills we have or what ways we do this and think about how we can share those, it's really part of that relationship building. Um, and even if it's sometimes like like um, wanting to like share a, a, a potted plant with someone, like it can be, it doesn't have to be like wildly like structural if that's not what you want to put effort into. Um, it can just be in nice little ways of like sharing an experience. Yeah, and the the value of having communities and like minded people and 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 yeah, others that you can chat with and and learn from, I think is um is hugely valuable. So it's a great answer, very well packaged answer, I think. Um, okay, we're going to do a quick fire round for Kate's question. It's a good question. What are each of the panelists' favourite beauty slash natural spots in the UK? Uh, Maya Rose, chucking you on the spot. Ah! Um, oh, I've got an easy answer to that. I love the Isles of Scilly. Um, I think they're beautiful. It's oh. prob I'm probably biased because I'm a birder, but I think they're fantastic. Any time of year, including the winter, you get lots of great birds turning up in the autumn. Um, and I spent a lot of time there as a kid and I love them. Do you have a favourite bird from the Isles of Scilly? Is it too hard to pick? Well, the, the first bird that I remember seeing on the Isles of Scilly was when I was maybe three or four, and it was an American robin on Tresco, I think. So, does that blink an egg? Blink an egg. Add it. I bet your bird list is ridiculous. Um, Ellen, do you have a favourite nature or beauty spot? I'm biased, but uh, rural Essex, <laughs> I think, is massively underrated. Like the salt marshes are gorgeous. We've got snakes. There's owls um people think of Essex and I don't think people tend to think of it as necessarily a rural area but it's gorgeous love it love it and love Gina it. what's yours I can't decide between two can I say two you have to pick one um, no, I'm kidding go on <laughs> I'll be really quick um there's a place in the Peak District called Lathkill Dale and it's got a beautiful river I can't express how beautiful it is. And the like the greens that you see there uh, is incredible. Um, but then also there's a local park in Sheffield that's uh, called Bowl Hills. And it's like, you get a really great view of Sheffield as well as like, it's not just a park, but it's got so many wild areas. And I just feel like it's a very beautiful natural place to just like go and have a picnic and have a nice time. <laughs> Love it. Um, I'm going to throw in mine. Has anyone been to Skoma Island here off of Wales? Please say yes. No, no one's been. Right, that's no. it. After this, we're going on a trip. It's epic. <laughs> it's got um, seabirds and I was surrounded by porpoise and dolphins. It's epic. Um, no one wanted to know mine, but now you know. Um, <laughs> Julie asks, this is for, for you, Maya Rose. Um, how do we seek to spend time in nature in a way that is in sync with the wildlife and birds around us? And what should we be doing to support our neighbours? I love that question. <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, I could take that very literally and be like, yeah, you should go out at dawn to see birds and dust to see birds and things like that. But I, but I think, um, I think honestly, there's like, I think the way that we always act is very much like 
I know we own this and we dominate over this and we can do whatever we want with this land. When in reality, we're often just visitors to somewhere that is a home for other animals and other creatures. And so I think like, you know, on a really basic level, it's just being really respectful of other animals' homes. Um, but I mean, I think the British are really big fans of putting up bird feeders and stuff like that, that really gets birds through in the winter. So I think just put, like creating ways to look after the nature around you, whether that's like cutting little hedgehog holes into your fence or putting out food for the um, uh, badgers if you've got them. I think, yeah, sorry, it just boils down to like caring for and looking after the animals that you're lucky enough to have around you. Yeah, and understanding the environment that you're in. So as you mentioned earlier, sometimes just sitting in that environment for 20 minutes, like what are the sounds, what are the smells, what are the sights? Yeah, I think you summed it up perfectly. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions. Um, Ellen, I'll, I'll come to you for this one, if I may. This is from Caspian. Hello, Caspian. Uh, lockdown has led to more people using the countryside and appreciating the outdoors. How can we keep this trend going as restrictions are lifted? Good question. Yeah, really good question. I think we definitely did see a lot of people connecting to nature more than ever last year. So there was like record demands for seeds, searches for like different plants and birds were up 10 times. Um, and that was for the, I just want to kind of clarify that, that was like the people that had the privilege to do that. So like people were using parks when they weren't in the areas where the parks were being closed. People were using their gardens and growing stuff where they had the space to do that and, and to connect to nature. So a lot of us did have that lovely, um, there was this renaissance of love for nature, but that was kind of a very privileged thing that happened. On the other side of that, people in lockdown who didn't have any access to any nature, you know, stuck up on the 14th floor of a tower block with no green spaces nearby. So I think the question is, how can we keep the trend going and also bring in the people who were excluded previously? Uh, and I think the answer to both of those is, is an active inclusion, is an, is an active outreach um is setting up these kind of community um organizations which um both of my other panelists have touched on um to really reach out to people and to encourage people into nature because our society at the moment is very much based around being indoors and being kind of you know uh, this idea of humans as masters of nature rather than part of it and i think we need to start breaking that down um and start really reaching out to people to encourage them into nature and then once people do connect to nature i think you do see that it does self-sustain because once people have made that relationship it does have a, a hold of significance for for a lot of people if not most people i would argue um uh gina i'll come to you for, for this one nicole asks how do we combat these issues at a systemic slash government level all of you tonight have, have, uh, have talked about how this is also a, a bigger problem on a higher level so how would you suggest we tackle that very daunting problem says nicole <laughs> um i agree nicole uh, about it feeling daunting um and it you know isn't something that like I'm thinking about this a lot like how how do we tackle this and for me there's a huge question around that thing about who owns land in England and Wales and why is that and how can we bring that into like the forefront and how can we express that to like some of our like local politicians about what that what we think that means for us but um it's there's yeah how you combat systemic change is never like as a lone person it's all about the communities you build and like for me a part of this research is something that I'm choosing to like actively share with like my friends and my family and people I know that I campaign with and like how we can think to tackle that like what really resonates to you and what's like a part of that issue that you could work on but also there are some really really amazing organizations that are doing work in this area that are like grassroots led and could probably do with resources, whether that be time, whether that be money, if you are able to like donate anything, like I would say off the top of my head, Land In Our Names is doing some really incredible work around this, as well as the Land Workers Alliance that support farmers in the UK. Um, and so like whether like there's a way that they are asking people to help, whether you can check those up on those and see like, oh, they're asking for help in this way, I can support in these ways. But I think um, I think a really core cool part of, of like for me combating systemic change is really remaining curious about what seems to be normal um, and asking loads of questions about why things are structured this way and pairing that with just like thinking differently about how it could be. You don't need to have like a perfect 
structure to replace what is our normal society right now. But you can have these sorts and you can have these conversations with people and things will just start to snowball. And especially if you're feeling daunted by it, which really resonates, you know, it is better to share this and have these conversations and see what comes out when you're building stuff together with people. Um, yeah. Hope. Yeah. Top tips. There. Top tips and some organizations to check out there as well. And I would highly recommend all of you watching to go and check out these incredible ladies and all their organizations and their work and campaigns and brilliant, brilliant initiatives that are really changing the future in terms of access for nature. A massive thank you to all our wonderful panelists, Ellen, Gina and Maya Rose. You are an inspiration to us all. It's been really fascinating hearing your thoughts and ideas and, and just about your work. I think you're all absolutely brilliant. And um, uh, of course, a massive thank you to Intelligent Squared and to Selfridges for putting on this wonderful event this evening. And a massive thank you to all of you for listening in, tuning in this evening and for your wonderful questions. Uh, that's it from us and goodbye. <laughs>